All right, this morning we're going to do another sermon request, uh, another interesting thing here, a Christian and their occupation. We're going to be talking about a Christian and what you do for a living, what you, where you work, the kind of work that you should do. But before we get started, I'm going to do just another little prophecy update, an interesting thing I found out this week. I've been hearing little bits and pieces of this over the last couple of years. The Jews, the Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem, have been preparing uh, things for the temple, the rebuilt temple that's going to happen in the tribulation. And I was listening to a radio interview, and they're getting a lot closer to that thing. They have a their golden candlesticks, the seven golden candlesticks, the menorah. They have one of those things built now out of solid gold. It weighs 100 pounds. So you figure that up at uh, $1,600 plus an ounce for gold. <laughs> it's worth a little bit of money. Uh, it's just a very interesting thing. Another interesting story that was told, uh, there was a Jewish couple uh, that had moved over to Jerusalem from, I think it was New York, and the husband was a woodworker, a very, very good, skilled woodworker. And he asked his wife the one time, he said, is there anything that you would want? And she said, I'd love to have a harp. And he said, well, I don't know how to make a harp. I've never made anything like that. And he was someplace, and and he saw an, a very ancient painting of a harp on a cave wall over there in Jerusalem. And so he kind of drew the design down, kind of rough sketched it, went home to his shop and kind of figured it out, and he built a ten-string harp for his wife. And the interesting thing about that is when people found out about this ten-string harp, uh, they just, you know, everybody got all excited. And here this ten-string harp is what's required for this temple. And this guy didn't even know that. And nobody else can make these ten-string harps. So we're getting very, very close to that, to the time of the rapture and the time of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, getting closer every day. Just kind of a little interesting update there. But let's get into the sermon here. Now, does God expect a Christian to work? There are some people that would debate that. And here's the scripture that they'll use. Matthew chapter 6. You can turn in your Bible this morning to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 24. Every, uh, I forget the exact statement here. I'm probably going to butcher it a little bit. But uh, I th something to the effect of every every heresy in this age is a dispensational truth for somebody else is basically what the thing is. In other words, there are parts of your Bible that were not written to you and many parts in the New Testament that were not written doctrinally to a Christian in the church age. And when people come and they take those promises written to another dispensation and they try to make them apply to the church, that's when you get heresy. And this is one of the ones that you'll get. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Well, there's no problem there so far. You can't be all about money and think that you can please God. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? And the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? One cubit, by the way, is about 18 inches. There's some debate, but, you know, 18 inches. Now nobody with taking a thought can add 18 inches. You know, maybe you could do it with stilts or something like that, you know, but... You're not going to add 18 inches to your stature, your natural stature. It's not going to happen. Verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven... Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? And see, Christians will read that, and they'll say, 
I don't even worry about it. I don't have to work. The Lord's going to provide. You know, don't worry. Well, what you need to understand here is that this was written to the Jews. And Jesus Christ as their king was offering them the millennial kingdom. So this isn't true for today, but it will be one day in the future. But now look at verse 32. You're going to see a very interesting thing here. Remember what we were reading there about taking thought for clothes and drink and everything else? Verse 32, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. The Gentiles? Why does Jesus mention the Gentiles? Because this is in the Old Testament doctrinally. You say, oh, it's the New Testament. No, we've been over this before. The New Testament does not start till the death of the testator, till Jesus died on the cross. That's what brings in the New Testament. Right here you have Jesus speaking to Jews. He's not speaking to Gentiles. And he makes a clear difference there. He's saying, hey, to the Jewish people, you're my people, I'm going to take care of you. You're not going to have to worry if you accept me as your king. But I'm speaking to you Jews. And those things that you worry about, those are the things that the Gentiles seek after. See, the gospel hadn't been preached to the Gentiles yet. It hadn't gone to the Gentiles yet. Why? Because Jesus was first offering the kingdom to the Jewish people. They hadn't yet rejected. But continuing here, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. All right, as I said, the, the Jewish audience there was being offered the kingdom. And they rejected their king, so the kingdom had to be put off for a while. Now, did the Lord know that that was going to happen? Yeah, he did, but he still had to offer it to him. You know, the Bible talks about God knows what you have need of before you ask him. Well, then why pray? So you get into that whole debate there, and that's where Calvinism starts to come in, where everything's predestinated and you don't even have to do any work. You know, you don't have to witness, you don't have to pray, you don't have, you know... That's nuttyville when you get into that. Okay, God knows what you have need of. God knows who's going to be saved. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to witness and we don't have to pray. All right, he still expects you to do those things. And he knew that he was going to be rejected. He came to the earth to die on the cross. He knew that, but he still had to offer the kingdom to the Jewish people. So what I'm trying to say is be very careful when you start going back under the Old Testament to try and get doctrine for today. So what about a Christian? Is there, what's the instruction for Christians today? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Read the book of Acts. They, they start out preaching to the Jews exclusively. And again, they rejected. And so what happens is Paul begins to preach to the Gentiles. And he actually shakes his raiment at one point and he says, I'm going to go to the Gentiles from here on out later part of the book of Acts. So here we are, the Thessalonians. These are Gentile believers. And you're going to see the instruction here that's different than Matthew chapter 6. The Sermon on the Mount is different. All right, Second, Th Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. It says here, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Command, it says there that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Hmm. You mean Paul worked? Yep. Wrought with labor night and day. Now look what he's continuing here. You say, well then, paid ministry is a sin. No, let's continue. Verse 9. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Paul is saying, we have power as he was a pastor, you know, basically. And, and he said, I have power for you people to have to pay for me, you know, to, to give me money. But I, as an example to you, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to work. I'm going to show you that it's good to work for a living, that you're supposed to work for a living. That's what's going on here. Verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, 
that if any would not work, neither should he eat. God's not for welfare. You know, maybe in some situations, if, a, if you have a guy that's in war or something like that, and he loses both of his legs and he can't work, you know, and he's paralyzed or something, well, you know, there should probably be some kind of a system there that can pay for somebody like that, that can help a guy like that. I don't have a problem with that. But if you are an able-bodied man or woman, man especially, you know, if you are an able-bodied man, you should be working. And if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Just as simple as that. Uh, verse 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Okay? Are you supposed to work right now as a Christian? Yes. Ephesians chapter 6. You say, well, that was only to one church. You know, that's you can't base all your doctrine on just one instruction for one church. Well, we'll see about that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Okay, it says here, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You say, well, this is talking about servants and masters. So it's talking about like a slave. Huh. It says whether he be bond or free. When you have a job, you have an employer and you have a responsibility to that employer. And when your employer says, I want you to take care of this, you don't say, no, I don't prefer that. I, you know, No, you do what your boss tells you to do. And you're to consider him a master and you're, con and you're to work for him as unto the Lord. Now, he's not God or anything, but the point is you're supposed to be doing the will of God. And what is that? To live as a good Christian example. In the workplace. Look at verse 9. And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Did you, did you know a good boss will not respect, be a respecter of persons? He won't have a favorite. He'll want to make all of his, have all of his workers be equal and, and you know, there are some that work harder than other, harder than others and those should be rewarded for it. But they won't say, well, I really like that guy over there. He's, you know, kind of the special guy, even though he doesn't work as hard as everybody else. That's not how you're supposed to be. If you're a Christian employer, you have employees underneath you, you should encourage them to work hard. You should be a good employer, as you would want God to reward you for doing right. So, too, you should be the same with your employees. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. You'll see the same similar thing here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Let me just stop there for just a second. Isn't that interesting that both in Ephesians and here in Colossians it says not with eye service? What's that mean? Well, that means that you work hard when everybody's looking. <laughs> you know, that's eye service. What you have there not with eye service is, when you, is that you work hard when nobody else sees you. You get your work done not as pleasing men. You're not a man pleaser. You don't say, oh, everybody's looking. Oh, I'm going to go volunteer for this thing or something like that. No, you don't do that. You work hard whether or not your boss is watching or not. See? That's what that means. Verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Can you live a very good 
victorious Christian life if you're a job jumper and never satisfied? Not really. What if you work hard, you're a very conscientious, very uh, virtuous type of worker, you, you want to do a good job for your employer? How can you live as a Christian then? Good. You can live very well. And that's what the Lord wants for His children. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. And I have to throw this one in here. <coughs> First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now that's a lot of, there's a lot that falls under the heading of provide there. Uh, providing financially, but also providing safety. But you see there the thing about if you don't provide for your own, uh, especially of those for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The Lord doesn't think too much of a man that's in good sh shape and yet not willing to work. That's a bad thing. And notice it doesn't say that the government is to provide for the family. First Timothy chapter six verse one and two. Now here we're actually going to see some instruction for what we would call slaves, bond slaves, bond servants, as the Bible calls them. Let as many servants as are under the yoke. These aren't free, they are bond. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And let and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now in our politi politically correct world, a lot of people get all excited and they say, well, the Bible is sanctioning slavery. Well, not really. It just says, if you are a servant, if you are under the yoke, then this is what you're supposed to do. It doesn't say go on out and buy a slave and then this is how you treat them doesn't say that and there are there are still countries where there are bond servants okay and it's not always a bad thing people have this idea that being sold into slavery is a horrible thing it wasn't always horrible i'll admit there was there was abuses i understand that you know but it wasn't always a bad thing uh and if you're in that situation you are to honor your master now, what are the Bible standards for an occupation, for a Christian and their occupation? What are the Bible standards? Well, if you are married and have children, you must provide their needs. Okay, You don't have the option of saying, I don't want to work, I'm just going to be lazy, I'll just sit around. You know, we had a missionary here at the house one time, and he said that he was a missionary to Colombia, lived down along the Amazon River, and he said that the men down there a lot of times would call into work and they'd say, I can't come into work today. Why is that? Well, I'm lazy. That was the real reason that they would give. I'm lazy. I can't come in today. <laughs> you know? Well, what's he doing? Well, he's not being a good husband. You know, if a guy's married and has a wife and kids, you have a responsibility to provide for them. If you want to be lazy and not work or anything like that, then don't get married. Don't have children. Just as simple as it. It just works that way. Now, if you are single, you still have bills to pay, usually, um, but you have greater freedom to provide for the work of the Lord. Okay, you don't have a wife and kids to take care of. So, you know, keep that stuff in mind. But both single and married Christians should do their work as unto the Lord. You say, well, I don't like my boss. I don't, you know, I can't stand my boss. Well, then get another job. <laughs> well, there aren't any other jobs. Okay, well, then quit your complaining. <laughs> Be thankful for the job that you have. You know, in this economy, I can't speak for all countries, but in this economy, you better be really happy that you have a job if you have one, and you better stay there and work hard. <laughs> you know, live as a Christian. You know, be be a good witness on the job site. Now, next question I have here, can you glorify God with the work you do? Okay, now we we had... We, you know, the discussion there, you should work if, you, if you're a Christian, whatever. But now, let's talk about the type of job. The type of work that you do, can you glorify God with that type of work? Should a Christian be, give you a couple examples here, 
a bartender. He said, oh, thank you, Lord. I really served a lot of drinks today. Well, <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. Now let's make one a little bit more closer to home here in Lancaster County. What about raising tobacco? That's a debate among some of the farmers around here. Well, you know, I, I'm just raising it. I don't, I don't make them smoke. You know, I just provide the tobacco. Ugh, ugh. I know a lot of the Mennonite farmers around here have convictions, and they say, no, I'm not raising tobacco. I don't want to contribute to that whole industry, smoking and chewing tobacco and all that. Nope. I don't want anything to do with it. What about working for a publishing company which prints normal materials along with pornography? Now, the, the person that actually contacted me about this message, they were in that situation where I went, it wasn't, you know, out and out total pornography, but it was, you know, things that had, you know, pornographic type pictures in it. You know, and, and this person said, you know, I don't, Want to, I don't feel right being there and, and printing this stuff up. I agree with that. You know, well, we print a lot of good stuff too. Doesn't matter. If you're printing bad stuff, part of your paycheck is coming from people buying that filth. Do you want that on your conscience? Do you think the Lord's pleased? What about working at a Catholic or Masonic retirement home? I didn't say working for a Catholic or a Mason. There are many big corporations and big businesses that you can work at that's owned by a Catholic or a Mason, but you're not helping to perpetuate that system. That's just their personal beliefs. That's different. Okay, I'm talking about going to a place that is an unbelieving place and has unbelievers all through it, and a lot of these places you wouldn't be allowed to witness for Jesus Christ. The Masons, if you go to a Masonic Lodge, you are not allowed to mention the name of Jesus. I wonder why that is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Should you work for people like that? Knowing where your paycheck is coming from? No, I don't think you should. How about selling lottery tickets? You're a Christian and you have a little general store. Should you sell lottery tickets? Well, there's good money in it. And I can give that money, you know, give it back to the Lord or whatever. I'll tithe my 10%. Uh and you see these people a lot of times coming in. You know, it always makes me laugh. I see people coming into Turkey Hills around here, which is our little supermarket that we have locally here. They come in and they'll buy a whole stack of lottery tickets with a credit card. And I'm thinking, uh, you're not really helping yourself there. And then they'll stand there and they'll scratch them off, you know, and then you see they throw them in the trash and they go back and they buy more. I saw, we were sitting at a Turkey Hill the one time getting gas, and I saw a guy do that three times. Went in, bought lottery tickets, came out, scratched them all off, shoulders slumped, threw them in the trash, walked back in, and he seemed to give me five more, you know. And I thought, man, it's a sickness. A lot of people have a problem with gambling. And I do believe gambling is a sin, by the way, so should you use that as a way to make a living? I would say no, a very definite no. Now, the next question comes up, should a Christian work on a Sunday? Here's another big debate. Now, we're going to go back to the verses that are going to be used a lot. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And like I said, this is the one where you're going to have some debate back and forth. Uh, but I'm going to show you what the Bible says here today. Exodus chapter 20, this is where your Ten Commandments are listed. All right, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, so what is the seventh day? Saturday. The seventh day is not Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. That's what it's called in the Bible. Okay, the last day of your, you look on your calendar even, the last day of the week is Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. 
And what will happen, if you want to go back to Exodus chapter 12 a while, Exodus chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 15. What will happen is you'll run into some people called Seventh-day Adventists, and they will tell you that, that the Sabbath day is God's holy day when you're not supposed to work. And Sunday, if you worship God on Sunday, Sun Day is actually like Baal Day, so you're actually taking the mark of the beast by worshiping on Sunday. <laughs> that's what these people teach. I'm not making that up. I mean, it's it's wacky, but that's what they teach. And we're gonna I'm gonna show you that that doesn't work. And they'll say, well, God never blessed the Sunday. It's not a day that God ever used. Really? Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. See the first day is mentioned there? Verse 16. And in the first day there shall be an holy convoca convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. Interesting how the Lord words that. The first day, it's a holy convocation. The seventh day, which is the Sabbath, is a holy convocation to you, he says. Uh, continuing here. No matter of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. So it's not that you can't do any work. You have to prepare meals. Verse 17. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day which I have, or have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, Therefore, ye shall shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. It's interesting because the modern Orthodox Jews don't observe it in the biblical way. <laughs> so they're actually disobeying the commands of God there. But you see there, the first day of the week and the seventh day are both called in holy convocation. So don't let anybody tell you that if you worship on a Sunday that you're somehow evil and wicked and whatever. It doesn't work. It's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, go back to uh, Ezekiel, or in Exodus, go back almost to your New Testament, right before you start hitting the minor prophets. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 10. Ezekiel 20, verse 10. We're going to see here the thing of the Sabbath day, What, why there's this connection between the Sabbath day and the Jews. Ezekiel 20, verse 10. Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. We were reading about back there in Ezekiel. Or, uh, excuse me, back in uh, Exodus. Verse 11. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover, also, as I, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might sanct or that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness, they walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said I will pour I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. Yet also I lifted up mine hand unto them in the wilderness, that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Because they despised my judgments, and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless mine eyes spared them from destroying them, neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers. Neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Now you can read the book of Exodus, and you'll see that very thing. They were continually complaining. They were continually sinning before God, and God was having to judge them over and over and over again. It's kind of frustrating seeing people that are that hard-hearted. Um, but before you're real quick to judge the Jews, you ought to kind of look at us too. Uh, it's a good thing we're under grace, saved by faith. But the point is, you see it there again, the Sabbaths are a specific sign to the Jews. Not to Gentile and Jew, 
but to the Jews, the nation of Israel. And it's interesting, I don't have this as part of the sermon, we're not going to go there, but if you read Matthew chapter 24, you say, or you see that thing again, of the Sabbath is back. So the Sabbath day does return in the future. It's not that God said, I'm done with Sabbaths, I'm done with Jews, they're all finished, they're all through. No. We're in a little time period here where God is dealing with both Jew and Gentile. But the times of the Gentiles are going to be fulfilled very soon. And we're going to go back to the nation of Israel again after the rapture. Now, should a Christian keep the Sabbath day? John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 19. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, when does the New Testament start? Before or after the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, I should say, too. After. John chapter 20, verse 19. This is after Jesus rose from the dead. It says here, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. Hmm, first day of the week? That's a Sunday, isn't it? When the doors were shut, where, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Why didn't he say to them, Hey, I'll, I'll be back uh, I'll be back in a couple days. I'll come back on a Sabbath day. He didn't. He came on a Sunday. And it goes into them. Then he told them, he taught them things there. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 6. When you get these Seventh-day Adventists or these people, the Messianic movement now too is another new heresy which came along. And they'll try to get you back under the law. When you start dealing with these people, they try to get you back to the Sabbath day. These are the scriptures you need to use. John chapter 20, verse 19. Acts chapter 20, verse 6 through 7. And then we'll be hitting a couple more here. Acts chapter 20, verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. So in other words, Paul had the ability to choose any one of those seven days to worship on. It wasn't that he showed up and he was going to be leaving the next day so they had to do it on Sunday. He had seven days. He had a full week to choose which day to, to worship on. Look which day he picks. Verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Did he preach them on the Sabbath day? No. Did he say, we have to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? No. He preached on the first day of the week, which was a Sunday. Romans chapter 13 Earlier we were back there in Exodus chapter 20. We were looking at the Ten Commandments. And, you know, the Bible talks about Jesus didn't come to do away, to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So we, it's not that we just totally get rid of the Ten Commandments, don't have anything to do with them, but you have to keep them in the right context. And what are the ones that we're supposed to keep? Romans chapter 13, verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery... Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Where was keeping a Sabbath day? It's not in there. Why? Because we're Christians and we don't have to keep the Sabbath. It's just that simple. Now the last one, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. We're going to see another example here of the early Christians getting together. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given on order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Did it say the Sabbath day? No, it didn't. It said the first day of the week. Right there. You say, well, then we're required to always meet together on the first day of the week. 
No. If you listen to last week's sermon, if you're living in a persecuted country, meeting every month, every Sunday morning from 9 to 12 is not a good idea. There are times that you're going to have to mix up your sermon time. Right? The Lord knew that, and he put that flexibility into the church. Okay, We have liberty. We'll be talking more about that in an upcoming sermon. But we have the liberty to worship on different days. But what I'm trying to show you here is you cannot teach from Scripture that meeting on Sunday is a sin. The Bible doesn't say that. And you can't say, well, we have to meet on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, we have to keep it holy. You can't teach that for a Christian. Now, you can ignore these scriptures in the Pauline epistles and go back and pretend that you're still under the law and you know mess people up. Yeah, sure, you can do that, but then you're going to be messed up doctrinally. All right. Now, then, the next question. Okay, you say, I see that we can worship on a Sunday. We don't have to keep the Sabbath day anymore. That's not a thing for Christians. Is it okay then to work on Sunday? That's the next big debate. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I'm going to look at verse 11. Going through the book of Luke in our Bible study. Of course, with all the holidays and everything and a lot of the weird scheduling and stuff around this time of the year, we've been kind of skipping a lot of the Bible studies, which, you know, we still study the Bible on our own, but meeting together, it hasn't been working out here a lot. But uh, this one we did uh, probably uh, two or three months ago now. But uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Now let me just stop there for a minute. Was he right in what he said? Yes. He was quoting back there in Exodus chapter 20. He was quoting the commandment about keeping the Sabbath day and not doing any work on the Sabbath day. See, he was following the letter of the law. This is a very important thing. The letter of the law said no work. You can cook meals, but no other work. Okay, that was the letter of the law. But what's the spirit of the law? Continue on here, verse 15. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. You see, Jesus knew the law. He's the one that inspired it. <laughs> he knew the law, but he understood the spirit of the law. In other words, there are certain times, there are certain situations when that law can be broken. I'll give you a good example. There's a police officer down along the road, and he sees somebody speeding. And he says, wow, that guy's going way over the speed limit. And he clocks him. And, oh, man, he's doing 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. And he says, well, that's not good. And just about then he looks and he sees a tree and it falls and crashes right behind the, the car as it speeds by. And he pulls the guy over and the guy says, I saw the tree starting to fall. I had to hit the gas to avoid. I couldn't stop in time. I had to hit the gas and disobey the law to get out of being killed, smashed by the tree. Now, see, a good police officer... He'll understand the spirit of the law. In other words, under normal circumstances, you shouldn't go over the speed limit. But if you have to, to avoid another problem, okay, go a little bit faster. Now, under normal circumstances in the Old Testament, and doctrinally, we are in the Old Testament here in Luke chapter 13. Under normal circumstances, you shouldn't be working on the Sabbath day. But if you see some woman who's in pain and needs to be healed, heal her. <laughs> okay, that's the spirit of the law. 
God's not going to get mad at you if you do something like that. You say, well, what's this have to do with us and our work, our occupation? Let me give you a couple examples here. What about Sunday work? What if you're a police officer? All the police take Sunday off. Nobody, No police officers can work. Well, that might be a problem. Because the criminals, it'd be, it'd be National Crime Day then on Sunday. <laughs> you know, If you're a Christian and you're a police officer, you might have to put a Sunday in every once in a while. I'll get back to that in just a minute. What about a firefighter? You hear the siren going off, and you know, and you look out in the distance, and you see the smoke coming up, and you say, "Sorry, it's Sunday. I can't, I can't work on a Sunday. Let it burn to the ground." You know. <laughs> uh, what about a healthcare worker? And again, the one that uh, the person that requested this sermon that's what they're doing now they're a health care worker and sometimes they're expected to work on a sunday what about that well no nurses go into the retirement home or into the hospital sorry you know if you if you have a problem on sunday i can't work no doesn't work okay it doesn't shouldn't happen <laughs> what about a dairy farmer well we kind of had a little reference to that here about loosing the ox or ass from the stall and leading them away to watering. If you're a dairy farmer, you can't just tell your cattle, your cows, you can't just go in and say, okay, girls, you'll be fine till tomorrow. Don't worry about it. We won't milk you today. Uh, you're going to have some serious problems. <laughs> some You're going to hear some cows exploding. You know, it's not going to work. There are certain things, certain occupations that you're going to be in as a Christian where you're going to have to work a Sunday now and then. Now, having said that, I will say this. If you are a healthcare worker or some place where there's a lot of employees, I would still try to say, I like to be off on Sundays. I believe that that's the Lord's day. That's the day I want to worship the Lord, my day of rest, according to Scripture. Is there anybody else that could work for me? If you can get somebody else that says, yeah, I don't mind. That's no problem. You know, they're not a Christian. They don't really want to be whatever and they don't mind working for you on a Sunday, great, sure. I'd still try to get out of it. In other words, don't just say, oh, well, I can work on Sundays, no big deal. I'd still try to get out of it. But if you can't, and you have to work an occasional Sunday, and you're in one of those types of fields where you don't have a choice, okay, the Lord's not going to you know, send you to hell or something for doing that. But what about wrong Sunday work? Are there types of work that you could be doing on a Sunday that would be wrong? Well, I would say any kind of material production. In other words, more work equals more money. You know, I have my brother-in-law right now works at a at a furniture factory, and they're so busy they got them working like 14, 15 hours a day, six days a week. And they're still, you know, barely keeping up with production. I mean, they're selling a lot of this stuff right now, which is a good thing. But now, see, the employers could go, hmm, if we could make one more day of work. We'd make that much more money. Ooh. See, now that's where sin comes in. When it becomes about money. When it's not, hey, I have to be there to help these people or I have to whatever. If you say, I'm going to work Sunday because I can increase my profit. No. See, then it becomes wrong. Okay, then it's a problem. But you say, are there any conditions for that? Well, I would say yes. If there's be an emergency like a flood or a fire or something like that where you have to go down to the factory and get stuff out of there before it burns or get stuff out before it starts to rain or help put a tarp over top of the thing because the roof caved in, anything like that, well, then go help, you know. But if it's, if it's working to make more money, eh, then I think it's wrong before the Lord. Now we're going to look at a couple more scriptures here and then we'll be done. Turn back to Exodus chapter 31. Is it good to work seven days a week with no break? We're going to look about that. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31 verse 12. It says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, 
that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. It's a very serious thing back then. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Interesting, because a lot of the Jews today do not keep the Sabbath. They do do work on there. Because a lot of the Jews are very, very wealthy people. Uh, I imagine the Orthodox Jews probably do keep the Sabbath, but that's another study. Verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. There you have your biblical R&R. Rest and refreshment. You know, there's a, a one of the things I learned when I was working in the woods a lot with logging and things and splitting firewood and everything is one of the secrets that the, a lot of the old timers figured out is if you had to do a lot of firewood and say you had to do other little odd jobs too, you didn't work totally on the firewood until that job was done. You worked a couple days on that and then you switched and did a couple days on something else to give different muscles a chance. Because if you just keep working the same muscles, you tire out very quickly. Why? Well, your body needs to be rested occasionally. And the Lord rested and was refreshed. And Jesus Christ, when he was here on the earth, there were many times he rested. Don't fall for this thing that you got to be out there working and serving the Lord nonstop and you can't ever take vacation, you can't ever rest, you can't ever be refreshed. That's nonsense. <laughs> You're going to burn out if you do that. And a lot of times there are people that have done that, men, preachers and things that have done that, they just push themselves and push themselves and push themselves and they run their family into the ground and they run their health into the ground and then they end up, they're weak and they're tired and spiritually they're down and they end up messing up and they destroy their whole ministry. Then they're out of the ministry permanently. The Lord does not intend for you to be some kind of a superpower workhorse that if you take time off you, you, you know feel guilty or something like that. No. And our modern society is very much geared that way. You need to be career driven. You need to be you need to have goals and, and work hard to achieve, you know, and, and to get lots of money and stuff. The Lord says, Hey, you need to take a day off once a week. <laughs> That's something to think about. The Lord's not against you taking a vacation. You say, Well, Satan doesn't take a vacation, Satan's active all the time. Yeah, and Satan's going to go to hell for all of eternity. <laughs> you know, His goose is going to be cooked in the future, and he knows it. See, he doesn't have the rest of heaven, you know, that refreshment of eternity in heaven with the Lord. He doesn't have that to look forward to. That's why he doesn't take vacation time. And a lot of his servants, a lot of these big globalist people, they don't take vacation time a lot either. And look at them. They're not healthy. They, they sacrifice their health to get as much wealth as they can and to get as much power as they can. Those people are basket cases a lot of time. We shouldn't be like that as Christians. There are times you just need to say, you know what? No tracting today. No street preaching. No visitation. No emailing. No nothing. I'm just going to rest. There are times you need to do that. That's not always easy if you're in ministry. You know, right now I'm working. This is part of my job description, so to speak. Sunday is the day I preach. Okay, but we don't have Sunday evening services here. Why? Well, because you need to rest. <laughs> you know, the day of rest is not coming and, and spending, you know, 10 hours of your 12 waking hours on a Sunday. You know, we'll spend that whole time worshiping the Lord and stuff. Well, that stuff, it takes work. The Lord wants you to rest. He doesn't want you to be all stressed out because you had a, this busy Sunday and there was arguments and we had a business meeting and we had, you know, you know, that's ridiculous. But two more places to turn to here and then we're done. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7. 
We were talking a lot about the Jews today. And we're going to see this thing here, how that the Jews are going to come back into the picture again. God's prophetic picture. That's why I talked about the temple um, being reconstructed here. Uh, coming in the very near future, they have most of the implements and priestly robes and they have the lambs for the sacrifice and the, the cows for the sacrifice, the red heifers and all the other stuff. They're getting ready. We're getting close. Why? Because God's attention is starting to focus back on Israel. And by the way, that's why a lot of us Christians, it doesn't seem like the doors of the preaching gospel are open anymore. It's very hard to get people interested in spiritual things. Why? Well, because the church age is almost over. People can still get saved, and if they're smart, they will. But we're just about at the end of this thing. But we'll continue here. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. This is speaking to Jews. That's why the book is called Hebrews. Verse 9. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Very true for a tribulation saint. They have to endure to the end. But it's not true for a church age saint. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 15. While it is said, Today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. That's another one of those things that new versions will change. They'll say all that came out of Egypt. In other words, all the Jews were rebellious and all sinned. It's not what the Bible says. It says, howbeit not all. There were some good Jews that came out of Egypt. Verse 17. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. There's going to be a lot of Jews that do not enter in to that millennial kingdom because of unbelief. You say, well, how do you know it's talking about the millennial kingdom? Well, let's go back to Second Peter chapter 3. That's what we're going to finish today. Second Peter chapter 3. I'm going to show you something very interesting here. Second Peter chapter three verses eight through nine. Now, if you remember what we were talking about here, we were talking about days. Okay, how many days are in a week? Seven. How many days did the Lord work? Six. What's the seventh day for? Rest. Verse eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing: that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing that any should perish. He knows that there are some, you know, most will perish and go to hell, but he's not willing that any should perish. He hasn't predestinated them to hell. He didn't create them to be sent to hell. It's up to them, it's their free will to choose whether or not they want to be saved or reject Jesus Christ. Most choose to reject. But the point is, right there you see that thing, and I believe that the earth is approximately 6,000 years old right now. I don't know the exact time. I don't know the exact year. I think our calendars are, are inaccurate. I think that there's some time that we probably lost there. I don't know. But the Lord, I believe, has a plan for this earth that, quote-unquote, work will be done for 6,000 years in that millennial kingdom which comes that seventh day will be a Sabbath of rest for the Jewish people and we as Christians will be returning with Jesus Christ and ruling and reigning with him in that day of rest. 
we will enter into that time period of rest. So in this time here, in the church age right now that we are living in, right now there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. God's no respecter of persons right now. Right now we don't have to keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath comes back in the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. <laughs> Jacob is another name for Israel. It's right there. Right now then, what I'm trying to say is, as a Christian, number one, you should have an occupation. You should have some kind of a way that you can pay your bills. All right, God's not going to provide food and raiment and everything for you. It's just going to float down out of the sky. That's not going to happen. You're expected to work. All right? That's the way it's supposed to be. So you have that. You're to serve your employer as you would unto the Lord. You're to be a good, hard worker. Not with eye service, not I want to you know, be the employee of the month and get my picture up on the wall or something. No. You should be humble. You should work hard. When there's disputes, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> unless it directly involves you and you know, it costs your job or something. Or unless you have to be honest and stand up for somebody. Whatever. But don't try to tell your boss how to run his business. Right? If, if he's a good employer and he knows what he's doing, be thankful for the job that you have and do your work in a way as that would be pleasing to the Lord and that would be a good example as a Christian. All right. If you have to have a job where occasionally it's a service type job where you have to provide for people and you have to work an occasional Sunday, where it's not about money, it's not about production, it's about taking care of somebody or you work on a farm or whatever, okay, fine. Do your work on a Sunday occasionally. But make sure then you take another day where you rest. <laughs> Don't work yourself too hard to the point where, you know, you're not getting any rest and not, you know, you're starting to have health problems and things like that. Don't fall into that either. The Lord took a day of rest after working for six days. You should too. So that's going to be it for this morning. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be getting to this Christian liberty thing next week or not. We'll see. But uh, that's going to be it. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.